Yes. Um, so, so I'm going to refer now to um, uh, various parts in doc uh, documents authored by Dr. Main, um, uh, 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 relevant to issues relating to uh, what action was or was not taken in response to the risk of AIDS uh, reflection or, or, or absence of reflection um, uh, and uh, what information was or wasn't provided to patients. If we can start with the litigation report at CBLA 5072 024. And if we go to page 40, This is the last um, substantive page of the report. What follows is simply um, uh, the footnoted uh, or, or endnote references. Um, but this is uh, uh, under a heading, duties of care and breaches of the duties of care. And then there was uh, some observations from Dr. Main in relation to hepatitis risk and then AIDS risk. And she says this, the earlier sections of the report affirm that haemophiliacs were at risk from hepatitis through the medium of their treatment. Um, she then refers again to what must be matters set out in the one of versions of the uh, HIV litigation statement of claim um, uh, about alternative measures. And she says, in general, they're impractical, but, um, but in particular, she refers to one of them, denies the goal of haemophilia treatment, namely to minimize pain and disability and to prolong life. Its conjectural implementation would have restricted the choice of treatment available to the physicians in charge of the patient the person in possession of all the information regarding the patient's needs. Now, I emphasize those sentences because they may be relevant to uh, any assessment you make, sir, about Dr. Main's views as to the patient-physician relationship. Um, well, it's, it, it's, um, it, it is not, as I read it, consistent with uh, the view which was clearly expressed to us uh, by the, uh, e the expert uh, ethicists. Uh, it, it, um, who emphasized, I think, the person in possession of all the information regarding the patient's needs, in the broad sense, is usually the patient. Precisely. Although, how best medically to resolve the, the needs is a matter of all which the doctor has very valuable information to give in the light of what he understands the individual patient's needs to be. Precisely have, I, so. have I summarized their view properly? Absolutely. Yes, and, and this appears to show a, a different concept or characterization of, of the patient and physician relationship with the physician essentially being the person in charge. So th this is a, a justification of paternalism, I think. Yes. Uh, then um, she continues, the alternative treatments, cryoprecipitate, desmopressin, and animal concentrates have already been discussed and found wanting for the universal treatment of severe haemophilia. Again, pausing there, um, um, it may be that those are treatments that would not um, uh, suffice for universal treatment. It doesn't necessarily follow that they couldn't be used for uh, treatment for um, some at least severe haemophiliacs. Um, then she says this, the risk-benefit ratio of non-treatment versus treatment could not be upheld, and I guess that begs the question of by whom, in the light of the plight of haemophiliacs in the era before infusion treatment became available, a return to bed rest, immobilizations, and analgesia for joint bleeds would have been untenable. Um, so strong terms there used by Dr. Main. Um, to characterise what she says was the, the option, uh, treatment versus non-treatment, and her identification and characterisation of the risk-benefit ratio predicated, it would seem, upon, or at least on one reading of this document, an assumption that that's ultimately a, a, a balancing exercise for the physician rather than the patient. Uh, in relation to AIDS, she then deals with it shortly by saying com comments of a similar nature apply to the paragraphs relating to AIDS. Um, so that's uh, 
the HIV report, if we then go to Dr. Main's main witness statement at WITN 0736009, and if we turn please to page 30, We look at the question at the bottom of the page, and it's a question that the inquiry has posed to most of the clinicians um, uh, to whom it has, um, or from whom it's requested statements, who were haemophilia clinicians practicing in the relevant time. Do you consider that your decisions and actions and those of the center in response to any known or suspected risks of infection were adequate and appropriate? If so, why? If not, please explain what you accept could or should have been done differently. And then Dr. Main's response at the top of the page, the two words could and should often suggest that today with the benefit of hindsight, it may cause alteration of decisions or changed actions. Like everyone else, I wish that none of my patients had been infected as a result of blood products. However, after careful appraisal, I remain convinced that the course of action pursued by both myself and my colleagues was measured and appropriate for that time in light of the information and the state of knowledge at the time. Uh, so that is um, Dr. Main's response. And then in answer to the next question, uh, what decisions or actions by you or by the center could and or should have avoided or brought to an end earlier the use of infected blood products, she refers to uh, that answer. Um, now, in terms of the question of whether patients were warned or provided with information or advice, about the risks of, of, of HIV so that the patients could make an informed decision. That's obviously a matter for you to determine. You will recall the evidence that the inquiry has already received and heard from patients themselves or from their relatives, which is, I think I'm right in saying universally to the effect that they were not provided with specific advice, warnings or information about risks of AIDS from factor concentrates prior to the, the group meetings that took place probably in January 1985, and which I'll, I'll come on to. So that's the evidence for you to assess from, um, from patients and from uh, so people who were infected or, or, or from their, their, their family members. In terms of Dr. Main's witness statement, if we stick with this, the document on screen, um, but go first of all, please... Um, to page 28. Bottom of the page is the question, did you take steps to ensure that patients were informed and educated about the risks of hepatitis and HIV? If so, what steps? Answer, I do not think I can expand usefully to answer this question other than um, as already answered previously, um, in, in terms of what's previously set out, it's not clear what um, Dr. Main is then is there referring to in the statement. Uh, there's little that I can see which talks about the provision of information to patients in the earlier part of, um, of, of her statement. Um, uh, there is a discussion which I'm going to come on to about um, what was done in response to the risk of AIDS but that all appears to be um, at a later stage but be that as it may that, that's Dr Main's answer to that question um, Is she possibly referring to other witness statements which she gave earlier? It is possible and I'm going to um, uh, go through where I can find reference in her statements to this issue. I, I can't guarantee that I necessarily re refer to every single p statement that she refers to it, and no doubt you will be reading them all again um, in due course, sir. Um, but but, it, but it, it is absolutely possible that she, she may be referring to earlier statements. Um, in relation to this statement, if we go to um, paragraph 43.1... So 
So I'm, I'm looking here for passages which deal with information provided to or discussions held with patients. Um, so it's page 31. Uh, she was asked about reversion to treatment with cryoprecipitate, and her answer is this. Theoretically, a return to using cryoprecipitate would have been appropriate for some patients. However, it was neither a practical nor realistic option. Following lengthy explanatory discussions during which the possibility of reverting to cryo was raised, I was greeted by an emphatic refusal from the patients concerned. Patients had become used to carrying their concentrate uh, slash pack with them to school, to college or their workplace. The presence of that pack had become life-changing, a return to being dependent on the availability of a fridge freezer and to the lengthy process of thawing and preparing cryoprecipitate was just not acceptable to them. Unfortunately, what that paragraph doesn't tell us is when it is said such conversations took place or what information was provided about risks to enable a judgment to be made by the patient. I should say I don't think we've seen anything in individual statements from people who were infected or, or their relatives which reports any such conversations. Um, um, but, 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 but assuming for the purposes of debate in Dr. Main's favor that she had them, as I say, it doesn't, it doesn't tell us when she had them um, um, and, and whether it was at any stage prior to the group meetings in, in January 1985. Um, if we then turn over the page and go to the bottom half of the page. So this is under a, a series of questions relating to the provision of information to patients. She's asked the general question, what information did you provide or cause to be provided with, to patients with a bleeding disorder about the risks of infection and consequence of treatment with blood products uh, prior to such treatment commencing? The answer is no local leaflets printouts were available. Discussions with patients were held if and when possible. Each patient was provided with information provided by the National Haemophilic Society. There were few occasions when concentrate was given to patients other than those with haemophilia or allied disorder. I recall rare incidents when concentrates were given to counteract the excessive effects of warfarin anticoagulation. It was also used uh, for patients with advanced liver disease. Um, and she refers, top of the next page, to instances where concentrates were used erroneously on an emergency basis within the ICU. So again, that doesn't actually tell us what information was provided. It merely says leaflets or um, information from the Haemophilia Society was provided and discussions were held with patients. But the content of, of that information remains unclear. Um, if we go to the next page... Oh, sorry, we're already on it. Sorry, stick where we are, Shemek. Paragraph 47.1, you'll see the question that's been posed of her and by reference to the, the, the uh, HIV litigation expert report was uh, picking up on her assertion that patients became aware of the risks of hepatitis during the mid-1970s. She's asked what the factual basis for that is and what discussions she had with patients in the mid-70s. What she says by way of response is an annual meeting for patients, relatives and members of staff was held as part and parcel of the activities of the Northern Ireland Group of the National Haemophilia Society. Over time, a multi multiplicity of experts was invited to be speakers. Each gave an opening talk on aspects of haemophilia, and then the afternoon was open to patients and their relatives to ask questions of the experts, questions about treatment, about the risks, about advances in therapy, changes in scientific research, etc. And then she gives a list of some of those who um, uh, spoke over the years. So again, that doesn't answer the question, um, the actual question asked, which is um, um, uh, what, what the discussions were. What's the basis for saying that patients were aware of risks of hepatitis? That, that doesn't address the content of any communications at these, um, uh, uh, what were said to be annual meetings, um, rather than the fact of them. If we go to the next paragraph, Dr. Main says, patients also had their own journal, magazine slash journal, originally started by me, but then passed on to patients, um, uh, entitled Clot. Um, again, doesn't provide us with any information. I, I don't say this in pejorative terms, just as a matter of fact. It doesn't provide us with information about what the content of, of any such uh, articles might be. If we go over the page, we then see the assertion at 47.4, 
Therefore, the patients in the 1970s onwards would have been aware of all aspects of haemophilia treatment and research if they attended their local society and read its magazine. Um, and, and that's well, it's a matter for you as to whether that's an, an adequate substitute for p p information being provided um, directly to patients by their physician. Um, if we go further um, down the page, um, there's then a question about what, what information is provided before the commencement of home therapy, um, uh, and there's um, a, a more detailed answer about the, the process of, of training families in relation to home therapy. Um, um, uh, in terms of risks of infection, what we see is at the bottom of the page, it's just said in the last sentence on the page, at all times, patients were advised regarding the risks of disease, any then known risk of using concentrate, and were encouraged to have discussions any time they had a problem. And again, there's a sharp contrast between what Dr. Main says um, and, and what those who provided statements to the inquiry uh, say in relation to, to um, being warned of risks. Um, and then we have the question at 50.1, when did you first discuss AIDS or HIV with any of your patients? At this distance in time, I cannot recall the details, but I've no doubt I had informal discussions with the patients at clinical appointments. The minutes of the UK HCDA meeting in December 1984 have been brought to my attention. I note that I attended, however, I cannot recall attending or the meeting itself. I assume that the decision to hold the 1985 meeting, so those are the group meetings held um, for patients in, in, in January, or thereabouts, was influenced by this meeting. It was then decided to have formal meetings. I arranged for three meetings to take place in early 1985, and she refers to those being described in, in her um, uh, earlier um, witness statement. So um, in, in terms of uh, any dates, we have the January 1985 meetings, which obviously is too late in terms of providing information in advance of treatment or in the course of treatment programs. And then we have the, the general statement that she has no doubt she had informal discussions with patients at clinical appointments. But we're not told what the content of those discussions were. Um, and, and again, um, the, the evidence from individual patients or, or their family members is, is to the effect that information about the risks was not communicated to them. And um, so that's um, uh, uh, what she says in her statement about information provided to, in, in that statement about information provided to witnesses, uh, to patients. Um, uh, if we go back in this statement then to page 28. She's asked the question, so this is now what, what actions did you take in, in response to the risk of AIDS? She's asked the question in, in, in 35, what if any actions did you take to reduce the risk to your patients of being infected with HIV? She says she followed the recommendations issued by UK HCDO in June 1983, which reflected my existing practice in any event. We've already explored that. That's the June 83 letter and the UK HCDO recommendations in relation to children, mildly affected patients and um, previously untreated patients. And then she's asked the question, did you continue to use blood products to treat patients after becoming aware of the possible risks of infection of HIV? Why? And she says this, within my response to question 33, I've indicated that I continue to use concentrates. Even with the benefit of hindsight, I cannot envisage otherwise. In reality, the choice was stark stop treatment with concentrates with all the risks and disruption that would entail for patients or continue with treatment in light of the information then available. So in common with some others who provided evidence to the inquiry from a clinical perspective or, or from some of the material we've seen in contemporaneous documentation, the choice is posed as this stark choice between, between no, essentially no treatment or continuation of treatment um, um, ra rather than a potential spectrum of choices. Uh, and she refers um, uh, uh, in the next paragraph to the special meeting of reference centre directors, and that's, uh, I think, an, an accurate reflection of what the outcome of the reference centre directors meeting 
in May of 1983. Um, I should draw your attention to a previous um, set of answers on page 26. Um, where Dr. Main has asked the question, what, if any, inquiries and or investigations did you carry out or cause to be carried out in respect to the risks of transmission of HIV or AIDS? What information was obtained as a result? Uh, the way in which Dr. Main has answered that is to look at the process of testing patients for HTLB3 and what happened thereafter. So there's not a suggestion in her answer of um, inquiries or investigations prior to the actual point of testing, uh, um, uh, which seems to have commenced at the beginning of 1985. Um, and we can see that um, because um, she that talks in paragraph 33.3 about what her expectation was as to how many patients would, would be uh, HTLB3 positive. Um, she poses a rhetorical question about immunity in, question, in, in paragraph 33.4. If we go down the page, she says, now this may be in relation to an earlier period in fairness, she says, the treatment policy was kept under review. Discussions and many conversations took place with the patients. Again, that doesn't reflect the evidence that individuals who were infected or their family members has provided to the inquiry, so those are factual issues that uh, will be for you, sir, to, to consider. Um, she says a return to cryoprecipitate was offered and was turned down. Again, there's no information as to when she says that offer was made or to whom. Um, and she says patients were asked to reduce their usage if possible. There's certainly um, a later letter from the late 1980s when there's a request for, um, for reasons of uh, financial constraint for patients to reduce um, their usage. There's no documentary evidence of patients being asked to reduce usage that the inquiry has found um, in um, the, the uh, first half of the 1980s, so relevant to the risk of, of AIDS. She then refers to offering testing to staff. So that, again, puts this into the either very end of 1984 or, or, or 1985 period. She refers then to, in the next paragraph, to regular patient testing continuing and where appropriate testing of partners being carried out. Again, that puts uh, what she's talking about squarely into 1985 or thereafter. If we go to the next page, the, the measures she then sets out, um, I think on a fair reading of the statement, all relate to the period from 1985 onwards. Um, uh, at least that seems the, 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 the likeliest reading. So she talks at paragraph 33.8 about needing to disseminate information um, uh, because of misconceptions relating to stigma. She talks in paragraph 33.9 about speaking on the radio, TV, attending a range of meetings to offset and counteract incorrect rumours regarding infection with HIV. Uh, she then talks about increasing staffing levels in 33.10 and in 33.11, liaising with colleagues from other disciplines. So that's looking, I think, then at how to treat and care for those infected with HTLV3, HIV, um, um, rather than um, the, the, the prior question of, of, of what steps were taken to consider um, the best response to the risks um, in advance of those risks um, actually um, being fulfilled. Um, so that's, um, uh, I think, the, the most um, relevant uh, uh, part of Dr. Main's main witness statement. If we then look again at information about um, uh, the circumstances of infection and dates of seroconversion, we can pick it up at BHCT 40484. Um, this is a letter uh, dated the 15th of October 1985. It's from the Regional Virus Laboratory at the Royal Victoria Hospital to Dr. Main. And it says, we've completed the retrospective study on our stored stira from your patients. 
the results of the anti-HGLB3 zero conversions from negative to positive are as follows. And so I should say what flows from this and um, is uh, um, acknowledged by Dr. Main in her statements is that in common with, with other, some other haemophilia centres, samples of sera were stored. Um, think in the, the regional virus laboratory, pr primarily, possibly exclusively. Um, uh, to what extent that was with the knowledge or informed consent of, of, of patients, I think, is, is probably unclear on the, 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 the state of the evidence. Um, uh, but as a matter of fact, there were stored sera examples, samples. Um, and that enabled this exercise to be undertaken for um, uh, a number of those uh, who had been found to be positive for uh, HIV. Uh, and the dates are significant. First one, last negative result, January 84. First positive result, July 84. So serial conversion within the first half of 1984. Second one is last negative result, October 84. First positive result, April 85. So serial conversion in the last months of 84 or, or the first months of 1985. The third uh, uh, suggests serial conversion in the period between February and October of 1983. The next, August 1983 and January 1984. Uh, then January 83 and January 84. Then November 83 and June 84. September 83 and February 84, February 83 and November 83, September 83 and March 84, September 84 and July 85, August 83 and um, uh, March 1984. And then there are um, four uh, patients uh, listed um, for whom we have a first positive result. Um, uh, the earliest of those dates being February 1983 um, and, and one being at February 1984, but no earlier stored serum samples. Um, uh, and so what, what we can see um, from that uh, list is no apparent zero conversions prior to 1983. The, the earliest date of a, of a last negative result is January 1983, and the majority of the last negative results are later than that. And that obviously raises the question of whether, given what was known in late 1982 and by the beginning of 1983, um, these were avoidable zero conversions. Um, so that's... Um, information about uh, the patients um, who uh, were found to be uh, HIV positive. As Dr. Main's statement says, there is also um, one spouse or partner uh, who was infected um, with HTLV3. Uh, uh, um, you'll recall Dr. Main's statement saying that there were no children who zero converted. Um, however, that might depend upon one's definition of a child. Um, if we go to BHCT four zeros eight four six underscore zero zero four, um, if we go to the next page. So this is a letter um, um, from Dr. Main to Dr. Machin in the haematology department of the Middlesex Hospital, 18th of October 1985. Uh, obviously, the patient details are redacted, but you can see, sorry, if we go up the page, the date of birth is, is 1971. This is a letter written in 1985, so um, it refers to a 14-year-old. Um, for, for the avoidance of doubt, I confirm it does refer to one of the uh, patients listed um, in that letter we looked at a, a few moments ago. Um, and we can see from this, um, it, it, it refers to a moderately severe haemophiliac, so not severe, moderate, uh, moderate severity. Um, and if we go to the bottom of the page, 
we can see um, this paragraph. The most significant problem with him is the fact that the human material given in January, uh, so I would seem to be that's January 1985, given what's set out in, in the rest of the letter, produced zero conversion on the 10th of July 1985 with the positive HGLV3 result confirmed. I have not told the patient this result, nor his family at the present time. This, again, I, the letter is October 1985, so um, three months further on. The reasons are due to the precarious family base of the patient. Um, uh, and um, uh, the, the, the letter continues over the page, but there's nothing um, material for present purposes in that letter. Um, so that would suggest that um, a 14-year-old was infected and infected at a late stage uh, and uh, the uh, fact of his infection withheld from him and his family for a period of time. Um, if we go to BHCT 40860, and we go to the next page. Again, this is picking up upon the suggestion in Dr. Main's statement that there's no, no child was infected. This says surveillance of pediatric HIV infection and AIDS follow up. Um, uh, and if we look um, uh, um, further down the page, we can see, has the child received treatment for HIV? Yes, and we can see that the child's received AZT. And if we go over the page, Sorry, we're back to the first page, I should say. We see the reference to um, th this patient having um, HIV-related symptoms and, 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 and details are, are, are there given. Um, and um, uh, so, again, obviously, patient identifying details are redacted by the in inquiry, um, but uh, it appears from the information we have that it relates to um, the same person, uh, uh, pa same patient as... Um, we looked at in relation to the previous letter. Um, if we then go um, to uh, um, one of the other documents authored by Dr. Main, again looking at zero conversion rates, it's RHSC 5067 underscore zero zero two we've looked at this previously um, it's dr. Main's March 1988 report if we just pick up on something she says on page four under the heading HIV positivity at the bottom of the page uh, she says the HIV antibody positive rate for severely affected patients in the UK is 54%, uh, with some centres having ratings of 75 to 80%. I think we've seen 44% cited elsewhere, but um, in any event. Um, in Northern Ireland, only 16 patients have been shown to be antibody positive. This is equivalent to 25% of the most severely affected patients and 16.5% of all treated patients in the province. And then she goes on, and we, we looked at this yesterday, to suggest that that may be explicable upon the basis of the policy of using um, a single concentrate. Um, and I've explored the extent to which that was, in fact, adhered to um, uh, uh, in, in practical terms yesterday. Uh, if we go to HCDO 40s. Well, just just before you, you leave this, if we can just go back to, to page one. It's a completely different point. But... Um, uh, and... It, it. No, sorry, uh, forget that. Forget that. Fine. Um, if we go to HCDO four zeros two five, sorry five two four. Um, th these are the minutes of. Um, a meeting of the AIDS group of haemophilia centre directors. That was a group established, I think, at the beginning of 1985. This is the sixth meeting, October 1985, and Dr. Main was a member of that group. 
um, uh, if we just go to page four, we can see at the bottom of the page, Dr. Main um, making the same uh, point, suggesting that the incidence of positivity in her patients was low, probably because all her home therapy patients were kept on one product. And as I say, that doesn't, doesn't appear to be correct, although um, um, the, 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 the individual patient data we have doesn't clearly distinguish home therapy and hospital therapy. Um, some had only received one product for 10 years, uh, and then there's a discussion amongst directors of the variable incidence of positivity between centres. Um, it, it's not, um, I think, clear that it's accurate to say that the patients, if, if this is what Dr. May was saying, that the patients who sub zero converted were all severely affected patients. We've looked at one example already uh, in, uh, uh, of someone who was described as moderately severe. Um, if we then go to um, BHCT 40612. This is a letter from Dr. Main dated the 23rd of August 1994 to Miss Spooner in Oxford, and she says this regard as I further to your query regarding patient. There has been no documentation of his receiving treatment since 1974 because that is the state of his hospital records both here and in a peripheral hospital. Agatha Christie, or otherwise known as Dr. Elizabeth Main, found out that he'd been given two bottles of Edinburgh Factor 9 on the day his niece was born. It was never written down by the kind doctor who administered the dose and it led to much consternation for the patient, his family and myself. The sad and ironic aspect of the whole performance was that the patient did not need the factor nine. He has mild Christmas disease and does not suffer from hem arthrosis. The doctor who saw him either forgot or did not realize these facts, and he now sadly has full-blown AIDS. Um, again, the, 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 the patient cross-referencing between the documents available to the inquiry identified there it is, it would appear, one of the patients listed in that letter, that list of, of, of zero conversions. Um, so there we have a, a, an account of a patient with mild haemophilia B. Um, uh, even on Dr. Main's account, having been given factor nine, not, I should say, according to this letter by Dr. Main, but, 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 but elsewhere. Um, uh, um, uh, completely unnecessarily. Uh, uh, it's not clear from this or, or from the other material the inquiry um, has, I think, um, uh, wh which hospital that treatment um, was uh, was administered at. Um, but, but it obviously raises an issue that we've, we, we've seen explored elsewhere in relation to, to other centres within the United Kingdom of, of systemic problems with, with hospitals which were n not um, full haemophilia centres or doctors who were not um, uh, uh, um, knowledgeable uh, about risks uh, providing treatment where it wasn't required. Um, if we then look at the question of the meetings that were held in January 1985, and we, so we can take that down, Shirley. I'm sure you'll recall, sir, from the Belfast hearings, some very vivid testimony about th those meetings at the hospital. Um, uh, and, and I'll just—I'll have to, to, to dart between different statements, I think, in order to, to see what's said about th those meetings by Dr. Main. Um, so, if we start with. WITN 0736001 and we go to page 7 and um, so this is Dr. Main's statement in response to a, a, a number of, of, of individual statements from uh, uh, 
people who were infected, um, a number of whom were giving evidence at the oral hearings in Belfast. And in paragraph 2.6, she says, uh, categorically, there was no HIV testing carried out before the meetings that were convened in January to March 1985 at the Royal Victoria Hospital. So that, uh, that, that assists in, if, if that's correct, in, um, uh, in telling us that, that there was no HIV testing in the course of 1984. Uh, um, we know, of course, that there were HIV tests or HTLV-3 tests carried out in relation to samples from 1983, 1984, and, and, and possibly earlier. Um, but she says there was no HIV testing, and she gives that window of January to March 1984 as the, the, the dates when... 1985. 1985, sorry, when these meetings occurred. Um, if we then go to WITN 26580002... go to the second page, we see that this is the uh, report on entitled a synopsis of haemophilia with Mr. Malachy Devlin, and we looked at uh, and explored the evidence relating to Mr. Devlin um, in the uh, oral hearings in Belfast. Uh, um, uh, if we go to page 12, and we pick it up at the bottom of the page, bottom half, we can see Dr. Main saying this under the heading December 1984. During December 1984, plans were laid to interview all of the patients attending the Northern Ireland Haemophilia Centre. It was felt that the opportunity should be offered to all to have frank discussions regarding the possibilities of becoming infected or already being infected by the AIDS virus. And so we can see there's no reference to any earlier meetings um, in this document, as I recall. At that time, a test was available to measure antibody to the HIV virus. There was no test available to test for the presence of the actual virus, i.e. there was no antigen test available. Therefore, it was not possible to predict the consequences of finding a positive result. The arrangements took several months to complete as patients were requested to come to the centre in small groups to allow sufficient time for discussion and debate. Actual testing of samples commenced on the 2nd of January 1985 each sample was coded, the prefix was BV, Belfast virus, and each patient's sample was allocated a sequential number commencing at BV1 up to and including BV396. When the results were available, they were entered into a confidential notebook retained by Dr. Main and kept in a locked filing cabinet drawer in her office. Access was permitted only to two other people, the chief MLSO in the haemophilia laboratory and Dr. Main's personal and confidential secretary. And then, although... So just um, pausing there. Yes. This is not consistent with what you just uh, referred me to at page 7 uh, of uh, witness uh, 0736001, where she said no testing was carried out before uh, the meetings in January to March of 85. Here, it uh, is saying the testing did begin, isn't it, uh, on the previous page? Um, she's saying the actual testing began on the 2nd of January. Yes. Um, uh, well, how, how does that fit with that, um, uh, what you said at um, page 7? Yes, so no that's WITN 07360001. Page 7. Uh, well, so unless... Um, there was a it may just be relating to Mr. Kirkpatrick, but it seemed to be more generally expressed. Yes. Because it's talking about meetings, so it, it, it looks as though it's wider. No HIV testing carried out before the meetings in January to March 85, i.e. none before March, 8, March 1985 meeting. Yes, well, that, that's that's obviously not consistent with, with saying that the actual testing commenced on the 2nd of January 1981. I just wanted to confirm that yes. that was so. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, and then in terms of um, the meeting themselves, um, it seems from trying to piece together the evidence that there were a series possibly of three meetings. Um, you'll recall, I'm, I'm sure, and I'll just put it up on screen briefly, um, the one of the oral accounts you've heard uh, um, 
from a, an attendee at the meeting, WITN 1371001. This is from the statement of, of Louise Marsden. And if we go to um, the fifth page, bottom of the page, the, the date that's given for the open meeting is 1983, which appears to be unlikely to be correct. But it, it, it's the characterization of the meeting that's of value here. Um, uh, um, um, so it refers to the open meeting where Dr. Main announced that everyone would be tested for HIV. She gave the haemophiliacs present the choice of whether they wanted to know the results of their HIV test. And she says, I, I found that bizarre. Um, if we look at um, one of Dr. Main's responses at WITN 0736005, and if we go to, so this, this is in response to um, the Marsden's statements, if we go to page 10, I think it is. Um, you'll see um, uh, Dr. Main giving um, this description uh, in this statement. She says, three open meetings were held regarding the problems of HIV infections. Two were held within the confines of Ward 37, Royal Victoria Hospital. In addition to patients attending the meetings, RVH members of the porting, catering, and cleaning staff were all invited to attend and express their worries and queries about HIV infection. The staff expressed much gratitude at having all their problems aired and clarified. Unfortunately, the meeting to which the witness and his wife attended had perforce to be held in an alternative venue. This was because a terrorist episode had necessitated the occupation of all bed space in the hospital. The alternative venue was unsuitable for severely affected patients as the seating was not appropriate for patients with severe joint disabilities. Therefore, proceedings were foreshortened and perhaps not as much information as previously was presented. I seem to recall that on this occasion, Professor John Bridges, head of academic hematology and consultant clinical hematologist, attended as a support for myself as I'd been up all the previous night on emergency hospital business. It was neither practical nor possible to carry out long consultations on an individual basis, but the situation was as dressed as far as possible when the person was having the test carried out. Uh, so that's Dr. Main's account of the meetings in this statement, and this raises a question about the appropriateness of having both patients and members of porting, portering, catering, and cleaning staff um, all in attendance together. Um, if we then go to WITN 0736006, this is another of Dr. Main's um, witness statements. Um, uh, and if we go to the last page, please show me. Um, Dr. Main says this, later within the deposition of Louise Marsden, she referred to the 1985 HIV meeting as bizarre. She was completely correct in her description, I agree. The explanation is as follows. I've been up all the previous night dealing with the unclottable blood of a patient in the intensive care unit. The hospital was full to capacity, therefore the normal venue for the meeting was unavailable. It had been commandeered for emergency bed space. Um, I think the full capacity was related to an increased incidence of influenza and pneumonia. So that's a different reason. It maybe nothing turns on it, but in any event, um, I just observed that. However, the only available space for the meeting was the historic old surgical extern theater. It was unsuitable in every respect. The space was confined. The seating was unsuitable for disabled patients and the general impression inhibitory. It was not possible to cancel the meeting as transport had been arranged for the disabled patients and others were coming from far afield. And she gives some examples. Professor John Bridges attended as support. He was concerned that I might pass out from fatigue. I have not discussed this aspect of the meeting previously, so it seemed irrelevant. However, in view of Louise Marsden's apposite description, I thought I should enlarge on the detail to the inquiry. Um, uh, and um, then 
uh, if we go to WITN 0736001. Um, again, this is another of Dr. Main's statements. Um, uh, and if we look at page 11, please, bottom half of the page. Um, th this is in response to a recollection of the meeting described by Mr. Um, Hamilton. Um, and Dr. Main says this. When the possibilities of the viral infection became known in 1984 towards the end of that year, meetings were planned to meet with all patients who'd received treatment. They began in January 1985. Routinely, they were scheduled to take place in Ward 37, Block A, Royal Victoria Hospital. Initially, Mr. Hamilton's description of a hexagonal room caused bewilderment. After two weeks' consideration, I remembered that Ward 37 was not available for one of the scheduled meetings due to an influx of emergency admissions the previous evening. The only hospital venue available, therefore, was the St. Ian Fraser Lecture Theatre, which was located off the main hospital corridor. It was a historical venue, as it was the old anatomy and surgical theatre for teaching medical students. It was in the form of a rotunda with a glass ceiling and tiered seats, which were very uncomfortable. It had old-fashioned heavy wooden doors, which clanged shut when closed. It had been refurbished and was used for weekly physicians' meetings and postgraduate seminars. Sadly, there was no facility for tea and coffee. Um, I, I refer to that because th this meeting was obviously a very significant event in the memory of a lot of individuals and it seemed important um, to draw out what information we have from Dr Main about it. She then continues, I cannot recall how the subsequent blood testing was arranged and so it sounds as though there was testing undertaken on this account immediately following the meeting. It may have been necessary for the attendees to walk to a nearby ward. I do not remember, I can certainly remember that the room was not locked. There was absolutely no justification or reason to take such a step. Um, and then, perhaps in contrast to some of the other accounts, she, she says here, as much time and space was given for discussion as was necessary, that, that may, of course, be a reference to individual uh, taking of samples rather than the group meeting, I don't know. All samples were tested and labelled anonymously by a code. Um, uh, and then... Um, well, I might as well read this so I don't have to come back to it. I'm going to look at the process for giving patients their diagnosis in a moment. She says, patients plus relatives were invited to come back to receive their results. If negative at first, it was thought a letter might be a good idea, but this was rapidly rejected. All but two families returned for results and both received a home visit. The situation was dire and all members of the centre staff did the best they possibly could. Only 16 adults tested positive, but for each and every one of them, it was then a disaster. All patients accepted the invitation to be tested, but some deferred the appointment to a more convenient time. Um, uh, so that's the, 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 the further description we have from Dr. Main of the, the group meetings and the arrangements for testing. Um, I, I should say that in the evidence the inquiry has received from individuals, um, whilst it's absolutely right that there is evidence of patients being informed of their diagnosis in person, there is also evidence of patients being informed of their diagnosis, both negative and positive, in some cases, by letter. Um, uh, so um, that, again, may be an, an, an area of um, uh, where there is a factual conflict that you, that you sir, may, may wish to consider in due course. Um, one of the themes um, that has emerged um, from the statements of those who were infected or from their family members is as to the adequacy um, of the information that w was provided when um, uh, patients were told um, uh, their uh, 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 HIV um, uh, diagnosis. Um, and again, you'll recall, so again, it's a theme that the inquiry has heard, both in relation to evidence relating to Belfast and in relation to evidence relating to a number of other uh, centres, um, uh, criticisms or concerns expressed about the adequacy of the information that was provided. Um, it, um, it, it has been, to some extent, a, um, perhaps a, t a, a fairly typical clinician response to say, much was uncertain and the information that was provided was the information that was known um, at the time. Um, th there is a, um, uh, uh, some evidence um, um, from individuals suggesting that 
their impression was that, that they were given no choice about whether to be tested for HIV, only as to whether they were, uh, wished to know the results. Um, and if we look at... Sorry, I just need to check a reference. Um, WITN 2658009... Um, these are the terms of, of a letter written to, to one patient, to Mr. Devlin, and again, we, we, we l looked at a lot of the material relating to um, his tragic case in the oral hearings in Belfast. But this is a letter, uh, 25th of March, 1985. Um, uh, so it, it helps give some context as well and, and, and a chronology to the period of time over which testing was being undertaken. This is late March. Uh, and Dr. Main is writing saying, um, we have serum for the antibody to the virus. A positive test doesn't mean that the person will be developing AIDS, but it's important to carry this test, um, carry out this test. Uh, and she says, I want to know the antibody status of all patients before receiving heat treated material. So that would suggest that as at the 25th of March, 1985, patients were still receiving unheated concentrates and the change had not taken place or at least not taken place for all patients and then it's a please come for a simple straightforward blood test so um, it, it, it could I think in fairness to Dr. Mainby said there's no compulsion there but equally it could be said in fairness to some of the criticisms that have been expressed that there's no statement there that it's a choice for the patient to make. Well it, it sounds a bit like um, uh, like rationing um, the, the heat treated material presumably because of a, a shortage I, I don't know but um, yes, a, a, as to uh, the the question of were people did they think that they were obliged to have a test or, or not? Uh, does she uh, ever deal with the the question of why would you give people a choice uh, as to whether they wanted to know the results if they'd had a choice? as to whether they should be tested in the first place. Um, I'm going to check that because um, I'm confident Dr. Main does deal with it somewhere. This might be one of the places. WITN 07360005. Uh, if we go to page 5... And we look at the bottom of the page. Uh, you'll see this um, is in response to an individual witness statement um, um, and reference is made to, to the witness W1371 statement describing the meeting um, and the witness saying that Dr. Main said all haemophiliacs in the room would be tested for HIV because she was erring on the side of caution. And so Dr. Main's invited to comment on, on the patients only being given the option to choose whether they or not they wanted to know the results of the testing. This is Dr. Main's response. HIV testing was offered to all those who had been in receipt of blood factor concentrates. The witness is correct because in carrying out such widespread testing, it probably was erring on the side of caution. However, at the time of actually testing, the patient was invited to give consent. And if they had any difficulty in doing it, the test was easily postponed until a future date or not carried out at all in accordance with the patient's wishes. Several patients postponed testing, but none refused. It seemed only right and proper that they should be given the opportunity to know or not know the results. One of the secretaries took a note of the names of patients who did not wish to know the result. And then she, she deals with the individual patients um, in, in question, um, or the individual patient and, and, and his uh, spouse in question. Um, uh, um, and then I should, I think, perhaps point out the next answer. This is dealing with the more general question um, about uh, um, the suggestion that n not sufficient information was provided about HIV. At 2.10.1, Dr. Main's response is each patient, when tested, received the maximum amount of knowledge available and was offered appointments at any time to discuss important issues, important issues relating to HIV. So again, it doesn't really tell us what information 
was routinely provided to patients at this point in time. I can, I can check whether any more detail is given elsewhere. But that's Dr. Main's response in, in this statement to, to um, the question that you raised, sir. Yes, it doesn't, doesn't really uh, 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 deal with the point uh, at all, which is really a question of argument, um, uh, I suspect. Uh, and it may simply be that um, he was offering people not only a, a test, but if they didn't want to know the result, they didn't want to know the result. But it seems rather curious that you'd expect people to go for a test without knowing that they, without wanting to know the result one way or the other. Yes, I'm not, I, I can't but say that. But that. it's just an observation, yes. and, and it may simply be misplaced because of the nature of the times and, and the, the difficulties that she was facing. Um, but if, um, I can be addressed on that in due course. If it's, uh, if it's regarded as of importance. Yes. Um, I should, I think, probably just refer you to two other passages in Dr. Main's other statements that deal with this issue. I don't think they cast any further or additional light um, on, on the matter, but, but, but for the sake of completeness, if we go to WITN 0736001, page 13... top paragraph, uh, and again, this is in response to the statement of Mr. Simon Hamilton. She says, uh, it was decided that all patients who had received factor treatment, whether in the form of cryoprecipitate or freeze-dried concentrate, should be offered testing for HIV. Patients and their relatives were invited to a succession of meetings to update them on all known risks and information about the virus. Again, that still doesn't tell us what the information was that, were provided, that was provided. The meetings took place between January and March of 85 at the Royal Victoria Hospital, Patients were invited to be tested. It was a matter of choice whether they wished to do so. No one was compelled to participate. And then she says, um, I'll just find the reference. Um, WITN 0736009, page 35. Uh, paragraph 51.1, so bottom half of the page. I've set out previously that I arranged a number of special meetings in 1985 with the patients. At that meeting, they were invited to be tested. Their express consent was invited for that testing. And prior to such testing, I had no knowledge of whether a patient was infected with HIV. I only became aware after the test results were received. Um, what's not clear, and, and we saw the date of the letter inviting Mr. Devlin to come and be tested, which was late March 1985. What's not clear is, is um, um, uh, the, why it took a period of time for the testing to be undertaken. There may be plenty of explanations as to why, but obviously um, every day, week or month that goes past, um, uh, it, um, it, it potentially puts patients or their, their, their relatives at risk. Um, uh, and so we've seen example in another case of a patient being tested, for example, in July 1985. So the testing process seems to have taken a period of months. That may simply be a reflection of what the facilities were that were available and the numbers that, that had to be tested. It's not clear whether there was any particular sequence chosen in terms of testing first particular cohorts of patients and then testing other cohorts of patients at a later stage. I'm sure we don't know one way or another um, what, um, th and those kind of details. Well, I, I thought you made the suggestion um, a few minutes ago that uh, at, at least one of the meetings, uh, those who were there understood they, they were to go down the corridor and have a test unless they wanted to de defer it. Well, that's, that's certainly um, what Dr. Main says about one of the meetings. I don't think we have the same detail about the, the other two meetings. Uh, and we know from, um, from, from other references that, that, that certainly not all testing was undertaken then. That may, of course, be a reflection of, of, of not all patients attending the meetings. Um, again, that, 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 that remains unclear. Uh, uh, in, in terms of the process then for telling patients their results, I've indicated that there's some evidence of patients um, um, saying in their statements or their relative statements to the inquiry that they were told the results by letter. Um, 
um, that, that's, there, there isn't evidence to suggest that that was a universal practice, I should make clear. Uh, if we look at WITN 0736005, and we go to... Um, page 10, please. Um, if we look at the bottom half of the page, paragraph 3.10.1. Now, this is in relation to relaying a negative test result. There was no intention to... Um, so the, the question is... The, 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 the criticism that Dr. Main's being asked to respond to is the appropriateness of informing a witness of their test result by a letter. Dr. Main's response is there was no intention to relay this information, but the secretarial staff had a difficult job to complete, and they would have assumed, despite the clipboard entry, I think that's a reference to where she'd taken information about how people wanted to be told their results, but I'm, it, it may be wrong, that you would be pleased to know the negativity of the result. It was the policy of the centre not to send positive information via a letter either patients were told when they came to the department or else I myself visited them to discuss the positive results. Um, you'll recall, again, we looked at this during the Belfast hearing, but uh, I think it's probably worth referring to, um, again, in the context of the issues we're currently exploring. Um, it was a letter BHCT 40896, Um, this is October 1985, uh, and um, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll recall this letter, sir, because of the, the uh, evidence you heard about the relative's concern about the language in which it was expressed. So this is not a communication of the outcome of the first test. It's a communication of the outcome of the investigations into dates of serial conversion. You'll be glad to know that you became positive sometime between February 1983 and October 1983. With no sample between those two dates, I imagine you became positive sometime during the summer of 1983. Therefore, you've more than passed the two-year point. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, I should then show you what Dr. Main said in response, because she accepted that the use of the word glad see, would seem to be appalling. Um, and if we look at WITN 0736001, And we go to page 10, paragraph 4.2. This was Dr. Main's account of telling this particular patient uh, how she communicated the result to him um, and that she did so in person by visiting his house. Um, and then she explains the, towards the end of the paragraph the context of the, um, the letter and what she says, the seemingly appalling use of the word glad, um, uh, um, because um, she says it was in response to him asking uh, if, uh, if she could find out exactly when he was infected and him saying he would be glad if she could find out and let him know. So um, th th that, that's communication by letter of zero conversion dates. It's obviously not the, the same as communication by letter of the uh, um, the positive result itself. But as I say, there is some evidence the inquiry has received of which suggests that that was the position. Um, we've already looked at a letter in relation to one patient, the patient who was um, 14 or thereabouts, um, uh, and um, the fact that that patient and the patient's family had not yet been told uh, their um, uh, 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 the, the positive uh, HTLB3 result. Um, if we look at BHCT 40846 underscore 003, Um, you'll see this is a letter of the 18th of October 1985 to a school. Before we look at the um, um, what's there set out, 
um, it, it's a letter of the same date of the letter that was being written to a doctor in London. So a doctor in London's being told the positive result for a particular patient in October 85 in circumstances where the patient and their family has not been told. Um, and what we see here appears to be, or hints at, um, the um, Dr. Main wanting to let the school know um, that that's an inference that you could draw from the letter. It's not clear. She asks for a personal conversation um, with um, uh, the person to whom the letter is addressed at the school by telephone in, in, in the second letter. So it, it raises the possibility that others were being told of the diagnosis, but not the patients themselves um, or, 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 or their record. Um, we, we can take that down. A again, um, there are a number of different accounts the inquiries received. Um, th there are patients who have no recollection. There was a patient who has no recollection of, um, of um, being tested or um, being told of the test result, which was negative, uh, only discovering being tested on um, receipt of, of, of medical records. Um, uh, um, again, and to try and get, get some understanding of the dates when testing was being undertaken, if we look at WITN 2607004, Um, this is a letter, the 12th of February 1985, um, uh, and it says, I'm sure that by now you've heard that X's blood example was positive for the AIDS-related virus. Um, uh, and, and then it refers in the next uh, paragraph to retrospective samples being sent off, and then a suggestion that all re other family contacts come in to be tested. Now, that... Um, Again, it's unclear, I think, from the information we have as to whether the, the communication of that information by letter to family members was done uh, with the patient's consent or not. Um, and then in terms of just a further example on the issue of communication of test results, if we go to WITN 026. Five zero zero one. This is if we go to page fourteen, I think, and we pick it up in paragraph fifty. It says this in nineteen eighty five, prior to telling me that I was HIV positive. Dr. Main had come to the house when I wasn't there and told my parents that me and my two brothers had HIV. When I went to see her, I told her I'd not wanted my parents to be informed, but she said that it was better for them to know. Um, so, um, uh, obviously, highly material evidence there um, in relation to uh, um, HIV diagnosis. Um, and then, uh, if we how look... Old, how old is that... Uh they were an adult um, in 1985 would have been in their 20s I, I'm afraid I don't know of the, of the, of the brothers ages um, and then if we go to WITN Two six five eight zero zero eight. Again, I think we um, probably looked at this when we heard the testimony relating to Mr. Devlin at the oral hearings in Belfast. Um, um, but again, it just provides a little further light on the, the, the process of telling patients their results. So this is August 1985 to a GP. Um, the problem of testing for response to the AIDS virus is well known throughout the media, and my policy has been to ask each patient when they're being tested if each individual wishes to know the result or not. 
at the meeting, Malachy himself declared that he did not wish to know the result, therefore I have respected his wishes and have not informed him. Um, but then Dr. Main says that she's written to the patient's spouse. Um, and, and of course, that in itself may um, ultimately um, uh, give rise to the inference of the, uh, um, the, the patient themselves being infected. Um, so that's, again, th th these, are, these are bits and pieces of jigsaw information of, uh, relating to individual patients, which may, may assist you in forming an overall view, sir. Um, uh, Dr. Main has responded to that. Um, uh, in her statement, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference noted down, um, but I note the time and I can pick that up perhaps at two o'clock. Um, there are a handful of further references uh, and, and documents to look at on this issue, um, but they'll, they'll take longer than a minute or so, so perhaps we could uh, adjourn for lunch now. Well, two o'clock. Thank you, sir. Uh, two o'clock.